um, group. Uh, this is a panel called Evolving Leadership in an Evolving World. And each of the panelists is going to introduce themselves. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy Damrell uh, with HDR. I am your moderator for the panel, so I'm the question asker. Um, we've got some questions to start, but we'll also take questions from the audience. I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, and then the panel will introduce themselves. So overall, this panel is looking to talk about the workplace changes that have really happened over the last couple of years and what the collective experiences have been and ideas or options teams through this change. We'll talk a little bit about kind of the interruption of the work styles that have happened, organizational, personal leadership opportunities, and um, kind of that mentoring knowledge transfer really picking up from the last presentation, which was fantastic, by the way. I had no questions because it was amazing. Um, and so um, kind of how do you really find this optimum balance between the organizational needs and individual needs in kind of the, the current paradigm that we find ourselves? So just a quick note, um, we are an evolving leadership and this presentation has evolved a little bit. Um, so Lara Kemmerich often co-moderates with me a leadership panel every year. She's in the president's um, breakfast, can't be here, but is really here in spirit and helped us to kind of craft the questions and craft the panel, so appreciation for her. And then um, we did initially talk about kind of having peers, but in the interest of time and wanting to hear from lots of different individuals and organizations and levels in their career, we pulled it down to this, these four individuals. So with that, I'm going to have the panels each introduce themselves, talk about their name, their role, a little bit about their current work, how they're working, if it's in person, virtually, a hybrid, and maybe how that's changed from what they experienced um, pre-COVID. Start here with Jared. Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Newcomb. Uh, I work with HDR. I've been with HDR for about 10 months. Um, my role is a little bit hybrid. Um, I'm still doing a lot of field work, so it's, it's very fluid in that sense. Um, and from the change from pre-COVID is, you know, work from home is a little bit more acceptable and um, it's a, a little bit more easier to do uh, than pre-COVID. My name is Hannah Thomas Call. Um, I currently work for Spokane County. I actually graduated from college in May, 2020. So I got my last semester to be virtual, which was great. We didn't get a graduation or anything. Um, I went to college in Alabama and then I moved cross country to Boise in 2020, I worked at a fully remote job for a little bit, then in a hybrid role as a consultant. Then last summer, I moved up to Spokane where I currently work at the county in a hybrid role. My name is Eric Wallagorski. Uh, I'm a vice president and a regional infrastructure lead for Corolla Engineers out of our Seattle office. Uh, I've been doing consulting for over half my life. So I'm one of the older ones on the, the panel to uh, give some experience as well. Uh, as far as current work, uh, we were one of the ones that, yes, we closed down the office for a couple of months when COVID started, uh, but I really enjoy that kind of differentiation between the work and home. And even though I have a home office, uh, I come into the office quite a bit. Uh, I'm in most of the days, three to four days a week uh, with sometimes uh, working remote when it benefits me actually. That's, it benefits you. I like that. Uh, Karen DeBaker, Clean Water Services, uh, West Portland metro area. Uh, public affairs manager, did I say that? Um, been there about 22 years. Um, the hybrid and how we're currently working is, it's interesting being a manager because I do try to model behavior, although I live far away from Hillsborough, Oregon. I live in Southeast Portland, so it's quite a drive. So while I've enjoyed remote, I am tired of my house. So I actually go in as much as I can, but I minimum two days a week is what we're required to do. But um, I like the flexibility and really hoping that uh, for the future, rather than saying we have to be in a certain number of days per week, it's just pick your schedule in the office or at home, but just get your work done. That's all that needs to be done. I just would like that flexibility and the ability to leave earlier in the morning or return home a little bit earlier, so. I think starting out with a question about building off of the last presentation about mentoring and that mentor gap. And sometimes individuals, especially earlier in the career might have a hard time asking. And I think one of the cases to be made for working more in person that you see in a lot of places is that relationship glue, it is that knowledge transfer, that mentoring, that informal conversations that happen in a break room or a hallway. Um, so I guess kind of I look into Karen first and then Eric, maybe talk about 
kind of what can be done to alleviate the concern, like what are you doing as an organization to pull out that mentoring within the framework of what you have right now? Um, it's funny because a lot of studies you read right now say that uh, uh, folks that are earlier in their career coming into the office is more advantageous because you're just kind of around more people and stuff like that. Um, I've had two new employees start, uh, actually three total in the last, in the COVID world and uh, uh, two of them in the last few months. And I actually asked them to come in more often than I do just to be kind of around. Um, but like both of them have said, it's kind of funny to be here when no one else is here. So um, so how how we're managing that mentoring, it, it is, it's more frequent check-ins, whether they're virtual or in person. But um, we've really, really, in my public affairs, communications, community engagement group, switched to doing walking meetings. And that's really helped, even if it's only once a month, but making sure you do have that in-person contact once in a while. So that does help. But yeah, and we've done similar at Corolla. So uh, Corolla engineers, you know, we have 50 offices across the country and no one office is doing a, a set thing as far as when we're in or when we need to be in. We have no direction requiring one day a week, two days a week. Uh, as a company, we've left that up to every office manager to make that decision. And in Seattle, we don't have a directive. Uh, that being said, I prefer to have my younger engineers in as well. Uh, I think the best opportunity for mentor mentorship and for a, a young engineer or a rising professional to uh, grow in a company is to grow that network. And it's really a good advantage to do that in person, but there are some also, also some really good advantages to having this now virtual technology, right? So. In my role as, as, as a lead for the Northwest, I'm responsible for not only Seattle, but Portland engineers. And we too have hired some young engineers uh, during this you know, last three years in pan pandemic. And we've instituted weekly you know, check-ins Monday morning. We just sit around on teams and we check in with people and we could be talking about you know, what, what happened over the weekend, but then we're also talking about you know, what are your priorities? Are you light on work? Are you heavy on work? What do you need from us as leaders in the company or leaders on a project to help you be successful in your job as well? So there has been advantages as well with this virtual to expand our, you know, our, our kind of our water cooler talks to more than one office at one time. So there are some advantages there as well. I think one other example I'll just share from somebody else is when the pandemic really happened. Um, a manager would like every Friday have a lunch at a different location kind of around town to just help people get together for lunch outside at the, the food carts in Portland to allow people like who even weren't going in the office to feel like they could have a community. So I will share kind of that other specific thing. Because um, I do also think this is a follow-up question I didn't ask you. For, you know, Emily mentioned, hey, for somebody who's a little bit outgoing, reaching out and finding mentors is easier than maybe somebody who might be less inclined to ask questions or, or be a little bit more introverted or uncertain. So is there a way that you all are tracking kind of that engagement and kind of checking in with regularity? Um, what does that look like to kind of really make sure you are pulling up individuals who otherwise aren't inclined to like go ask? Yeah, I mean, in, in the Seattle office of Corolla, we have a very concerted effort on mentoring. Uh, we meet as a management group once a month. Part of that discussion is where are our staff? And how many touches have, you know, do you touch this certain person? And then we'll go through actually a ranking and say, oh, you know, are there people in our list, especially in this virtual world when they might not be coming in that aren't getting actual touches from anybody in Corolla management or leadership? And what can we do to just invite that person out for coffee or invite that person out for lunch? So it's actually a really concerted effort that you have to do to make sure that we do get those touches for those younger staff. You know, I'll say really quickly, we, we, uh, we started what was called, which is a horrible name, a de-escalation unit. And that was for, actually it was supposed to be for last July when we were all coming back to the office full time, that didn't happen. But that, that committee still exists and they'll pivot the name a little bit, but it is set up to check in with employees. So while I check in with my employees, I encourage them to uh, uh, raise their concerns or keep, you know, adding it to the broader enterprise-wide effort to uh, keep everything open and honest. 
Another thing too, I'm not being quick, sorry, is we recently participated in Gallup and we did a whole big employee uh, survey. And it's interesting, the, a lot of the stuff that we're finding are questions and concerns that don't have as much to do with teleworking. It's more about, I need more understanding what my role is. I want more connection to uh, folks at a higher level in the organization. So stuff that was there before COVID is still there. And that has actually been more on the forefront of employees' minds, what we found. So I'm going to toggle over here to, to Jared and then Hannah and talk about kind of onboarding during this time. And I guess what are recommendations or things that you found helpful coming on to these organizations that you would recommend to others? Is there something that went great or a recommendation of how to do that? Yeah, when I started at HDR, um, you know, it wasn't required that you are in the office as a new employee because, you know, it was still, they still didn't have that requirement of, you know, coming in three days in the office every week. But I think what, um, you know, that expectation as a new employee to come into the office, interact with other people and interact with your new employees and colleagues is still there. And uh, what really helped me was, you know, I had those frequent check-ins with upper management and it didn't really matter who it was. It was nice that it wasn't just one person. It wasn't just my supervisor. There were other upper management uh, level people in my in my group that were there in the office you know frequently you know they kind of coordinated between themselves of okay I'm going to be in the office this day and make sure you know Jared's doing all right and his onboarding's going well and you know it, it was either like they all three were in the office or just one of them but it, it was very helpful that you know they made the effort and you could see the effort that they made to make sure that I, that my onboarding was going all right and make sure that I had everything so it sounds like when you were in the office, someone else was in the office. Yes. One person. So when I started at the county, we were wearing masks and still kind of in that half COVID where a lot of people were still mostly at home. So I was in the office full time for maybe two or three weeks where I was working really closely with my boss. And then we both went sort of back to partly at home. And one thing my boss did for several months was called me on Teams multiple times a day to check in, to ask what I was doing. And I don't want to say it was annoying. It was on the edge of annoying, but it was actually really great in the end because a lot of times we'd check in on a project, but then we'd also get to chat about something else. You know, he'd see my, my dogs in the background and we'd talk about that and his dog. And so it really helped to get that personal connection, having those one-on-one -on -one talks. Um, and it was a really good way to engage virtually that I think a lot of people aren't taking advantage of. But one of the benefits maybe is getting to know him as well. Yes, our organization. they're great. But, but I think this peek into like the human side of who we are at home has benefited some. Sure. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about different roles and expectations. So one of the things you know here is there are some roles that allow for some hybrid work, some roles that may not, or even within an organization, different supervisors might have different expectations for their team. So maybe talk about, you know, Karen from Karen and then Hannah, um, how are your organizations addressing this maybe um, lack of ability for everybody to have the same amount of flexibility? And so what are, what are how are you talking about that? We, um, uh, the group that I manage is very interesting because it's, it's public affairs, but then we also have our administrative, our administrative services team um, that works really closely with us and me. And uh, while, for example, our front desk personnel really aren't able to have a flexible schedule, we've been talking and we really haven't implemented anything yet. What can we offer folks that are in those roles to as an incentive or as an award or as something else to honor them as employees because they don't have the ability to be flexible. Um, I will say, and I am not doing a great job at this and something that uh, does keep me up at night that when we do larger staff meetings, really making sure I keep everyone's position in mind because not everyone has that same ability to be flexible. So we curtail our teleworking conversations a bit just to make sure that we're including everybody. So, um, so yes, I, the, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, we're still navigating that, but just obviously acknowledging that not everyone has the same schedule. What do you need? What can we do to support you? So at the county, we've really taken it kind of group by group and division by division. And some groups like the accounting, they've basically all been allowed to do remote work for as long as they want because they don't need to be in the office. 
And then we have other groups like our roads and planning where they really do have to be in there all the time. And my group were hybrid, we're the um, water reclamation group. And they've addressed it a little bit individually. There are some countywide policies of having a minimum of like three days in the office, but they do make exceptions for individuals where it just doesn't work for them to come in more, or some people like to be in the office every single day. So they've been really flexible with us on letting us do what works best for us. And even with some of our front desk people, we have one that works from home one day a week and she does a lot of her paperwork those days. And it's a really nice way to do it. So yeah, I'm hearing more and more. I have a, um, a good friend who works at um, our community development in our city in Illinois, and they are doing that just with their front desk and counter permit permittees to allow people to do virtual sign up so that everyone gets to work from home at least one day a week. And now they're actually talking about closing maybe the counter on a certain day um, to allow for that flexibility. And again, that would be the paperwork day. So again, you know, and I think um, doing that by polling their stakeholders in their community to make sure that's going to work for them. So I am seeing more and more of that. I think it still gets a little perhaps tricky when we have our O&M staff and operators. And so if we've got time at the end, if anyone's got some suggestions of how they're working with that within um, a city, that would be great to share. So we'll kind of maybe leave some, some moments at the end if anyone has any in the end. So Jared or Eric, anything to add there with kind of the variety of- it, It's hard. I mean, as a consultant, we kind of lived in this world pre-pandemic, right? As a consulting company, we gave flexibility to our employees to just get the job done. We don't actually care when you come in. We don't care when you leave. We, we care that the client is, is happy with the work we're doing and that we can get a job done. So we actually, at, at Corolla, it was interesting. When the pandemic hit, our IT team was already getting ready to roll out teams. We had started the process of doing a virtual, uh, you know, work together platform. So when the pandemic hit and we all closed down, our IT team went, oh, we were going to roll this out later this year. And we'll just roll it out now. Uh, so we had already kind of had that situation. So we, we, we don't have the situations that the, the agencies have, like uh, Amy talked about, where, you know, the operations staff have to come in. Uh, so we didn't really have that challenge. We do have CM, you know, you know across the country as well. But um, on the consultant side, we're, we're kind of allowed a lot more flexibility than what I hear from some of the clients that we work with. Thank you. Um, so in terms of kind of building these teams within this hybrid community, you know, I'm going to start with um, kind of Hannah here to kind of talk about, um, you know, what's working, like what do you see as being effective in building teams, and we'll talk, talk to Amy about that as well. So one thing I really like that we do is a lot of more personal meetings. So we do have our monthly meeting, and we're mostly back to person in that, which is great. Um, we often do that hybrid where one or two people will call in and it's really nice to have those personal connections, but in the virtual world, a lot of times they really encourage us to do those individual meetings with just someone you're working with on a project, talking to them face-to-face -face online. Um, and we're also very encouraged to have our cameras on. I think that's a lot of just the culture of our work is everyone turns their cameras on, everyone talks into the microphone. Um, whereas a lot of places you get people not turning on their cameras. And I think you miss a lot of that personal connection when you don't have your cameras on. Uh, for our staff, I do require now that uh, once a month for our staff meeting that they all come in. If they can't make it, that's great. We still have a Teams option available, but it's once a month for an hour. So um, it, the feedback has been okay. I will say that folks have told me that um, need to make sure that I'm making it worth their time, meaning that uh, it shouldn't just be coming in, obviously going through a laundry list of what folks are working on. So what we do is it's bonding. That's what it is. And I tell folks that. So we ask them a fun question. You know, we, everyone takes a rotation. Uh, if you were stuck on an island, what's the one tech you would bring with you? And what would you leave at home? You know, stuff, fun stuff like that. So um, but then the weekly, ch I do bi-weekly check-ins. I don't do weekly check-ins except for the two new employees that I mentioned. So I do weekly with them. But, but again, um, it's not about what we're all working on. We put that in a list somewhere else. People can add that in, but it's, it's mainly for bonding. So, what if, I was going to say, what have you found to be the most effective like team building, trust building moments in the past couple of years? Uh, offering food. <laughs> So seriously, so uh, we've been doing uh, planning meetings. We have this big strategy road mapping we're doing and uh, the big kickoff, I provided food. I said, hey, you're gonna go, 
if you come in, let's eat together, bring your food, that kind of thing. So, um, but letting folks know ahead of time. So I think I'm more prepared being hybrid for meetings where I let them know the agenda ahead of time. So they have a couple of weeks, get used to what we're going to talk about. Um, I do also say we have a few folks who don't like to talk as much as I do. So we let them say pass or add as they need be. So respecting that and not everybody wants to contribute in person. So, but I do require cameras on too. God, I sound like that dictator, but it is cameras on is very important. So at least for the first few minutes of a meeting. But I think that's about to your, you're talking about this a little bit. I feel like the engagement in person, and I know I'm a talker, but I feel like I also do try and be an asker. And sometimes, you know, when you ask for questions or ask for people's input, it can just be like, okay. So I guess, and, and also some people still really resist turning their cameras on even at home. And, and I know we've talked about this. I guess from your perspective, what would help increase that engagement of, of people who are especially new to teams or uncomfortable in that virtual space. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's more of a, more of a social problem is, you know, when the pandemic really started, you know, people were working from home and, you know, they kind of got used to the, the rolling out of bed and turning on your camera kind of thing for a meeting. And, you know, you don't look your best or your house is messy. And it was more of to, make sure there was no judgment on that part. Or even if, you know, you, you had a dog or not saying that your dogs aren't cute, but I'm sure they're very cute, which could sometimes, you know, bring up a distraction in a very serious meeting or in a meeting that you're trying to get, you know, action items accomplished. Um, I guess what helps that is to, you know, you've got the blurred background. Uh, WebEx doesn't have that. Not, for some of us, <laughs> but, as uh, an option. Yeah. Um, or, you know, kind of getting back into that role of making sure you're getting up on time to get ready and make and look professional. Um, those are kind of the things that help. And I guess, uh, you know, encouraging, encouraging them to, you know, it, it's unfortunate that you have to require them to turn on their camera. But if you kind of make it more of a social aspect, you know, of asking those questions, asking those personal questions just a little bit in the beginning, you know, you kind of take away from that and then you guys can start knocking down those action items. How are you like pulling out people here? Yeah, I mean, so it kind of happens organically for us in Seattle, but, it, and it's weird, uh, our different groups. So we have three main groups at Corolla. We have a water group, a wastewater group, and an infrastructure group. And I'm part of infrastructure, which at Corolla means anything outside the fence of a treatment facility for the other two. So the infrastructure team in Seattle comes in most days and it just kind of happens that way whether it's you know the, the 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 home office isn't really a great space or they just they enjoy the interaction uh so the infrastructure team comes in most days uh more so than any of the other groups but organically the other groups have started coming in specifically on wednesdays and we would actually organize our events on wednesdays to build that camaraderie in the office uh so we're in the process right now of doing our company fundraising for water for people. So we've set up our competitions on Wednesdays, whether it be cornhole uh, in the office or we did water pong or we have breakfast, uh, all in an effort to make sure I don't get a pie in the face, which is a whole nother story uh, that we can talk about after. Uh, so yeah, we've kind of just organically been able to set up an opportunity for us as an office to get together across the disciplines and actually have some of that Face time and camaraderie where we're not talking about work, we're talking about the fun stuff or what we did or what trips coming up or dogs. Uh, just to add one more thing, you know, with my with my previous company, what also really helped was having, you know, right in the depths of the pandemic was having a virtual happy hour, you know, probably uh, a Friday every other week or something like that, you know, again, to really engage people um, and to, you know, people who did have health issues can still be involved with, with the company as a whole. So one of the, um, putting our face up in front of me like, but one of the things I was talking about somebody here at the conference was, you know, during when we were all in the office, you might have 10 or 15 minutes a day where you have that water table talk or you're talking with somebody. But now if you're only in one day a week and all of a sudden you feel like, I just spent you know, two hours chatting with people, I don't feel so productive, right? So my question is like, do you feel just like that chit chat and, and team building that you get when you're in the office over a longer period of time, is that productivity? 
Like, how do we talk about? So Karen, I see you nodding. I'm going to go with you first. Please go ahead. I'm laughing because this happened to me last week. I only had so much time in the office. I had so much to get done. And uh, it was, everyone was, because we were, we had our monthly staff meeting. So even though we had that monthly staff meeting, people were like, hey, how you doing? People were stopping by and talking and I got nothing done that I wanted to get done. But I will tell you, I went home that day. I was so like, wow, I forget. I work with really great people. I'm so, you know, happy to have the job I do and work with these great people. But um, I've learned now when I go into the office that those are so, my social days. So I've just kind of made it like that. But, um, but as an aside, I also had to use the restroom because I was in meetings, da, da, da. And I was trying, I, I, you're eating, it, you're eating. Me, yes. And I took me forever just to get to the restrooms. People were like, Oh, how you doing? So, um, that, that face-to-face in person has been so invaluable. And, um, yes, I've just learned that actually being in the office, I get less done. So anyone else want to? So I found a lot of times when we have those days where a couple of people happen to be in the office on the same day, um, we do have a lot more chatting, but often it kind of goes back and forth between work and personal. We'll talk about a work project and then how it reminds us of this trip we went on. And then that trip reminds us of a different work project we need to talk about. So a lot of times we do actually cover a lot of the work topics we needed to, but we also get that personal connection in the same conversation, which I think is really nice. So what I'm hearing from you is, yes, that's productivity, but it's productivity in that trust team building way. So how to consult. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, honestly, it's not all that different than what it was pre-pandemic. It's just those conversations happened a little bit here on this day, a little bit on this day. Now it's concentrated. So it happened before. And just understanding that, that that's a major part of working together as a team is being able to have those conversations about, you know, what trip you're going on or what did you do last weekend? But it's going to be when you're in the office, it's going to be that concentrated part and, and yeah you make up for it again elsewhere as a consultant again we have the ability a little bit more flexibility because again we're very much deadline and project driven as long as we're still keeping the clients happy and the projects are getting done that's productivity in the office and it's and it's team building so it's very important do you feel, feel like most people are building that into their time now like it's been an evolution right or is that kind of adding the stressor now in a way i don't want to go in because then i'm no, that's an hour more I have to spend doing something else. So I guess kind of like, any thoughts there, Jared? Or I guess just to to keep adding on, you know, um, pre pre COVID, you know, I would sometimes have multiple people one after the other come to my cubicle and start talking to me about you know either personal things, but um, like the like I said, you know, it does sometimes flop between work and personal. And as someone who has worked in the field and talking with your other fieldwork colleagues, that really helps because that, that builds that, that team camaraderie and being able to get out in the field and complete your work, but also have a good time doing it, which I think is very important because you don't want to go out in the field and feel like you don't want to be out there. You want to be out there with someone that you, you know, have a really good connection with, that you've built that camaraderie with. Um, so yeah, I think, that's, I think that's great. Anything you're gonna add as well? All right, so um, you know, where it's about, we have about ten minutes to go, and you know what we, an, an individual work type we don't have on stage is somebody from that O and M operations maintenance kind of space. And I was wondering if there's anybody who wanted to share kind of how they're tackling that um, in their space right now, or things you're looking at to maybe work on flexibility, if to the extent possible. So an impromptu panelist, anyone? I see, do I see Jenny trying to nudge somebody to do that? Should we reach down and just like pull you up onto this? No, okay, we won't do that. We won't put you on the spot. I wasn't going to speak so much about uh, what we're doing because on an operations side, you you definitely have to be there at work every day. Uh, and so I am in a wastewater plant uh, managing uh, five other employees. But uh, what I guess a question I would have is, uh, and maybe this isn't the right panel for it, but but I know there's resentment um, or there has been resentment through the course of COVID with folks that absolutely have to show up versus those who can work remotely. And maybe how was that addressed if that applies to anybody on the panel? Um, yeah, I, I can definitely see where you're coming from. You know, even as young professionals, what I've seen is a lot of young professionals are looking for those jobs where they only can, where they get to only do uh, remote work. Um, 
And I think those people are really missing out. I think they're missing out on the team building experience of, of the company that they're coming with. And um, I guess to overcome that is, you know, if there's an employee that you really want to bring on with your company, really encourage them to come into the office, you know, at least once a day. And if they like it, maybe a second time a day. And kind of, I mean, it's it's really a trying to do that fluid type hybrid um, work environment that we, we that we've kind of expected these days. I think on the operations staff, knowing there's constraints about that flexibility, I guess Karen or Hannah, is there anything you know your organizations are doing to try and kind of work through that, um, you know, or offering anything for operations team staff? You know, I'll say we've done, um, we have done lately, we've been doing the cornhole uh, uh, activities and stuff like that at each location. Um, one of the things we do too is uh, I encourage staff to try and work at other locations that are treatment facilities once in a while. Now, granted, they're not in the field working, but um, just to make sure that they're spreading themselves out. Um, that resentment is very interesting because I find that even not just with the operations staff, but with staff who've been in the office, like our finance department and stuff like that, I'll come in the office. Oh my God, I haven't seen you forever. And they're like, yeah, hi. You know, it, I can, I feel it there too, because they've been here the whole time. But, um, but anyway, as far as the operations staff and our wastewater engineers and wastewater tech staff is trying to make sure that we're uh, having more activities where we're trying to engage folks. And I think I'm looking for my clean water services cohorts here, but I think the cornhole has been great. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't been able to go to the cornhole just because of my schedule didn't allow in driving. But I think that's been an okay thing that uh, where everybody can participate, but that takes effort. And so we're really making a conscious effort to engage. They might not work in the state or the Illinois Department of Transportation. And similarly, right, has had to be out and all that. And I know they're working through looking at more flex time. So there's some mandatory hours during the winter, certainly between November 1 and May or March. They, they kind of are working 12 hour days, I think now more than that. But outside of those, really looking at how they can build up comp time to allow for like maximum flexibility of work outside of that. So they can get overtime or get comp time, but not being in the union, it sounds like that's a really, a really kind of working back with union and making sure that how that's reflected in different positions is really where they're at. But they have been talking through strategies of, again, how to kind of maximize flexibility um, to the extent that we can with that critical piece. I'll, I'll offer that. But I can see where the, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Eric. I was just going to add, you know, kind of circling back to something you said earlier, what we see a lot at some of the clients that we've had is trying to work with the operations staff to do that rotational schedule to where, Yes, you have to have someone on site, but then on certain days, that person can work from home and get the paperwork done. And so they're working on flexibility to give opportunities for some hybrid type environment. But I think it's also really critical that the ones that come in and they, they have to come in, you recognize that. And it might not be enough, uh, but recognizing that level of effort that they have had to put in over the last three years is super critical. For our facility at the county, we're actually a design build operate by Jacobs. So all of the operation staff is Jacobs separate from the county. So there's already a bit of divide there where we're completely separate companies. Um, and as I understand it, before I got there pre-pandemic, they used to do a lot of joint potlucks and barbecues with both the county and Jacobs. And those went away with the pandemic, obviously, but they haven't really come back. So I think we have a much greater divide between the two companies than we used to starting with the pandemic. And are, do you know, there are plans to kind of start rebuilding or? There are hopeful, very tentative plans that hopefully we can work we can on. Start. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I guess any other questions from the audience? It looks like maybe uh, John. Uh, hi, John Beecham with the City of Post Falls. I had a couple of things to share on the subject of O&M and to be determined how successful they are. But one of the things that uh, the operators have requested, and we don't have a union, so it's easier to make this change is switching to 410 schedules or trying to find schedules that maybe aren't flexible in terms of when they show up and what days they're working but it does provide them with more time off in a concentrated time so they can do those things that would be a benefit of working from home if they can't do that um, the other thing we've been able to do is for our, our field staff 
to explicitly say, yeah, it's okay to take the vehicle home and have your lunch at home if you're in that area and uh, document that in policy so that we have defensible policy if somebody questions us on it, but allowing them to run an errand on their way home or something like that. And where it doesn't interfere with their work, be able to be flexible that way. So a couple of ideas, that, like I say, I'm not sure how successful they'll be in the next 10 years, but so far so good. Thank you for sharing that. Looks like we've got another question. I just wanted to share an, an idea that is not implemented yet, but it's been floated out to, to try to um, address the, you know, the resentment by the, the field staff. And um, um, where I work, uh, most most folks who work at City Hall, even even the field staff, need to pay for parking. So because you know you have people who can telework, not having to pay for the cost of gas and pay for the cost of as much parking. Um, the idea is maybe to kind of create a, um, a policy that would allow us to reimburse the people who have to be in every day um, for their parking costs and maybe even for their, for their um, gas. You know, so it's just an idea and we have to see how that floats you know, to um, uh, policymakers, but just trying to be creative about l leveling things. Thank you for sharing that idea. I like I mean, this is part of what this conference is about, is changing of ideas. Um, so Karen, were you gonna? Oh, one more. I have a question about leadership in both consulting firms like yours and product-based firms that serve the waste, the water treatment industry, and whether you can provide any insight into the tension between solving problems which have not been solved which is what customers want, big new customers, that means R&D versus selling products and services that are kind of ready to go, you know, so long-term revenue and development work versus selling stuff on the product list or services list today, that internal tension over revenue, future revenue, short-term and long-term revenue. That, that, was that a no from you? Uh, I, uh, so I think the question is about R and D in terms of, you know, are we doing like technology R and D maybe within the consulting space, for example? Um, so I look at like a lot of my personal philosophy, and I'll rephrase this, but um, and there's so much infrastructure needs, and where our workforce is, we probably need more optimization and automation through technology to get where we need to get as well. So kind of what would be our maybe our role to develop that versus kind of already just continuing to do. Where's the innovation? Yeah, I'm, so uh, Corolo, Corolo is, has a very large R&D group and that hasn't slowed down uh, at all through the pandemic. Uh, we have continued and it's actually our, our especially our water treatment uh, R&D group is based in Boise uh, and, and works across the, company, uh, the country. And we have found even through the pandemic, our, our UV validation testing and, and, and all of our R&D has not slowed down uh, at all. So research and development, and, and it can't, I mean, there's always going to be new things on the market that you need to, to, you know, research, develop. So we haven't seen any pushback to maintain the status quo, uh, that, that why are we spending money on R and D? Um, we've continued to do just as much R and D as we did pre COVID at Corolla. I know we're closing in on our time. I have this one last kind of like audience panel participation question. Really interesting. I'm curious, how many of you, um, how many of your organizations did a formal change management plan as you went through COVID? So at Corolla, there was never a specific directive change management plan. Yes, we, we would put out, um, emails came from corporate that said, hey, yeah, we, we are looking at what is the new normal. Um, again, at Corolla, we do not have a directive across the corporation as to how many days you're supposed to come in, how the new normal works. Uh, as we've gotten through it over the last three years, we are starting to see a little bit more formal, you know, we think a hybrid type environment is where we're going to end up, where you're 
in two, three days a week. Uh, and you had that flexibility from home, but there was never really a formal, you know, directive on a change management of how that flexibility was going to work. Or communicated. Or yeah. So at the county, we did have an official work from home schedule of you're supposed to come in three days a week or two days a week if you have a short week. Um, and we were supposed to all fill out our work from home documents of what days we're working from home and what days we're in the office. And we signed those and put them into the system. Those are not followed very closely. It's more of an outline, I think. Um, so I technically work from home Tuesday, Thursday. I usually work from home days I don't have meetings that I need to be in the office, which works a lot better. And they're very flexible, but we do have an official document that we all put in. Yeah, I would say with HDR, you know, um, in the past four or five months, we we implemented a, you know, a, a formal you know form of outlining what days and times you can come into the office you know with the requirement of coming in at least three days um it's very and you can you can um, put in to you only come in one day and one day a week but it's it's a case-by-case -case basis you know with with my supervisor he's very flexible because he understands you know he has kids himself and he has to pick them up at after school and things like that during the school year. So it, it's still, I would agree that there is a formal, you know, management change, but it, they're also not always followed. But I think that's a case by case basis with you and your supervisor, as long as you're still getting your work done and still being productive. Well, that's all we have. Time's up. I've got the flag. So I just want to thank our um, panelists here. So thank you very much for your time and energy. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to the audience. So.